Tony. It's exciting to be here. We're on episode nine, and I am excited because I got to choose this one. So that's right. I'm, I'm excited, excited about that. Yeah. And I'm so, excited that you're excited. Thank you. It's exciting. It's exciting to be excited. We're a little bit loopy <laughs> because you have been seeing clients all day and talking about all the things, yeah. and I have had yeah. a little bit of a crazy week and am mostly not as sleep deprived now. And it's eight o'clock at night, which is fun. We don't usually record late, so it's kind of fun. Right. Today, I asked you, I put in a personal favor, I've been wanting to talk to you about labels in general and how it applies to obviously the label of ADHD. That's what this whole podcast is about. I also think there's a further reach with just the idea of labels in general. It was interesting. I was talking to a friend recently who is going through a divorce. And because I've been through a divorce, we kind of we're sharing some story and just kind of how the process goes. And she mentioned that uh, her soon to be ex-husband has ADHD. And so that helped her kind of make sense of a lot of the things. And I very easily could have quickly been like, wait, you're divorcing him because he has ADHD. I could Mm -hmm. take that personally, but I was able to sit there and think about just, I guess, try to explore the emotion that comes with labels. And the more I sat and thought about it, I thought it's not the, and the more we talked about it, I thought it's not the label of ADHD. I think why they're getting a divorce. It's been the behavior, the manipulation, the not accepting, the not owning up, the the lack of change. Mm -hmm. And so I want to talk to you about labels and I'm going to let you talk in a second, but as I was No, I want you to go first because I have strong opinions on this and I don't know if we would be on the same page. Oh, so you kind of want to hear mine first. Okay, good. Uh, Yeah. Okay, yeah. here are my thoughts about labels. So okay. I grew up seeing labels used, I feel like, in a negative way. I'll just say that. And I felt like it was used as an excuse for bad behavior, okay? Mm. And I listened to a lot of conversations kind of confirming that other people felt that way about labels in general and that we shouldn't label people because that inherently means that they're not going to progress, they're not going to grow because this is just the way they are, okay? Okay. Then take me, I'm 21 and I'm like this positive, outgoing, go-getter, happy girl that will never struggle with my mental health, right? And I fall apart and I have my first panic attack. And for the first time getting into therapy, someone says to me, these look like PTSD-like symptoms. And there was so much relief that came from just hearing that label to have some sort of framework for the tornado that was going on inside me, the flashbacks, the nightmares, all the things. And since then, I have found labels to be very freeing, very helpful uh, to have knowledge from. I say that except for there are still certain labels that I do not accept for myself and I don't talk about because they're the same labels I heard growing up when I saw it used as an excuse. So if you listen to me, you'll hear me say terms like mental health. You'll probably never hear me say mental illness. Mm. I rarely will ever say I have depression or I have anxiety. I might say I have a susceptibility to it. So as much as I say labels have been helpful and like understanding that I have HD has helped me frame and make sense of so much in my life and be more compassionate towards myself, I too have my own issues with very specific labels and the way I've seen them used based on my life experience. So most people I know, especially if they've never been diagnosed with something, don't like labels. Most people that I talk to about this, I would say, and maybe they're just the loud ones. I don't know, but people have very strong opinions about we shouldn't label people. And I think this even goes into like, I think there's conversations even about how people feel about the pride flag, right? Mm -hmm. Why do, why mm-hmm. do you need a flag or Black History Month? Why, why do we need to have a month for that? We're just segregating each other more. We're isolating each other more. Why do you need to have a flag? And I actually, in my book, I see you, I talk a lot about, I have a chapter where I talk about sometimes I think we see in every group of people, I mean, we're all, we could say we're all part of a minority somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. We, ADHD isn't the majority of people. While there is a strong amount. It's not the majority. So we could say that's a minority if we wanted to. People will always use things to manipulate. There will always be people that will use things to create an excuse for their life, labels included, even a flag included. They could, right? They could use that. Mm -hmm. But my concern is that if we say labels are bad and we say the pride flag means 
that you're going to be this way. Or if you don't have the pride flag, it means you're this way. My concern is that we silence all the people that are hurting and struggling and have finally found words for their experiences and are just looking for a place to maybe celebrate, but even just accept and just acknowledge and have a place of belonging of my life makes sense and I have words for it and I don't feel crazy anymore and I like myself and I want to stay. That's my concern when we get too hard on labels is that because of the people that misuse them, then we say the whole group is that way and therefore labels make people this way when I just think there's crappy people in every group of people, in every religion, in every congregation, there will always be narcissistic tendencies where people will take whatever they can to use as an excuse, labels included. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. So those are my thoughts. I'll turn it over to you. I just, I was looking for, I was interested to see what kind of some common like quotes people use about labels are. They were pretty much all negative when I just Googled it. Mm. Uh, But one that I thought was interesting that is very, I feel like, reflective of what I've heard other people say is labels are for filing. Labels are for clothing. Labels are not for people. This is by Martina Navratilova. Maybe I should have practiced that before we got in there. Do you know who she is, Julie? No. (laughs) Do you know who she is? Oh, she's a famous tennis player from back in my day. Very cool. Well, and okay. And so my thought, labels are for filing. Labels are for clothing. Labels are not for people. My thought, if I'm going to be honest, reading that is, bless your heart. Like, you've never been in a life and death situation where you were so confused about what was going on inside you and then someone finally gave you some framework and then you had knowledge and knew kind of what angle to go about it. Like, I just, I hear that and I'm like, that's just too black and white for me. So what's funny is, and I don't, I would have to give it more, I would have to Google her, but I mean, she was one of the first, I think, big time tennis players who came out as gay, lesbian. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. so she, I'm sure, was labeled a lot of things back mm-hmm. in the day. Mm-hmm. The, and so that is kind of interesting here in that context. Yeah. Okay. I'm giving you permission to take the microphone. I've said a lot. Okay. I've said a lot. And you know a lot. And I'm being very vulnerable because I know you oh, love me and trust though. me, right? But there's, yeah, these are conversations that happen for me daily in my line of work. Yeah. Same. And it's interesting because I like where you're going with it because from my chair, then I'm starting with, I'm going to meet somebody where they are. So I, and so I'm going to go a couple different directions with this one and I can sound flippant or use humor. I was going to say too much, but I like using humor. So mm-hmm. if somebody comes into me and they say, you know, the last thing I want to do is be labeled an addict. I feel like that's this judgmental statement. Then I say, okay, then you are not an addict. And then if somebody comes in and says, oh, getting the label of an addict has really helped me take what I'm this seriously, then uh, then they say, what do you think? Then I say, okay, then I dub thee an addict. So I'm going to start with meet somebody wherever they want. And, and knowing that we were going to talk about this today, because we just, yeah, I think you had shared it. We had shared a text or two. I talked to two or three people today that have ADHD and two out of the three really have they appreciate the label. And then one of them says that it's something that they in essence hide from. So I do kind of, and I think from my chair, it's I'm going to meet somebody where they're at. And and there's a quote that I like that I don't know where it originated. I first heard it when I had a friend of mine named Sam Tielemans on my podcast talking about addiction, but he said the strongest force in the human personality is to act in alignment with how you see yourself. So however you identify yourself, you're going to find a way back to your home base. And so I use that one a lot when I'm talking about people that talk about addiction, where if they say, okay, I am an addict, I don't like that one personally. Mm. So, but if they say I'm an addict and then they, let's say that they're sober for weeks, months, whatever it is, but then in their mind, it's like, but I'm an addict. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to find my way back to that home base. Mm. But if somebody says I am lovable, I am a child of God, you know, Mm. then I can go and be and do, and then I might have a setback. I don't even really like the word relapse, quite frankly, Hmm. because I think it has such a negative stigma. So then they may have a setback and then, but I'm a child of God or I am lovable. So, so I I really like the concept of where, oh, I'm a good person. Um, As a matter of fact, I put out an episode on the virtual couch today where I was talking about how we, you know, I am Tony and I feel frustrated at times, but I'm not frustrated. I, I'm mm. Tony and sometimes I get angry, but I am not anger or I am not sadness. I am me. And then because then it starts to be a lot of kind of fun to be me. But then I will also feel these things. And then ADHD can be a part of who I am. But then again, not only does it not define me, but then it makes sense to me. And I like what you were saying, because I run into the I feel like the people that are coming into work on their like their mental health are saying, okay, I need to figure out who I am. And so this is a thing. And then I can call it something or I don't call it something, but how does it show up? And then what can I do about it? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So then, so that's where I sit with labels. So, and, and I remember I was in this, I was quoted in a recovery magazine once where I really thought I'm going to get just a bunch of crap from saying that I said all this stuff. And then I ended up getting a whole bunch of positive feedback. And it was, you know, in a recovery magazine talking about, I was saying, okay, if somebody wants to be labeled, whatever, then sure, whatever you need, but let's now let's start working on you you know, whatever that feels like to be you. Mm -hmm. But now I like what you're saying about what people do with labels. So um, I don't think I've talked about this here before, but there's a book called Nonviolent Communication and it's by an author named Marshall Rosenberg. And I think this is so fascinating. He has these tenets of nonviolent communication and even talks about how, you know, you don't typically think of communication as being violent, but I think it's exactly what we're talking about here. So, because, you know, we like to say what uh, sticks and stones can will break my bones. Is that what it is? Words can never hurt me. me There we go. Yeah. But um, so then Marshall Rosenberg makes this point where he says free speech advocates commonly argue that speech is the opposite of violence, that words can offend us, but they don't actually do harm. So from that standpoint, the concept of nonviolent communication would be this oxymoron. But then he says, though, that most people's default manner of speaking to each other is highly violent if you consider violence to include attempts at in essence, like cutting others down to size or coercing them into what we want them to do, or by telling them what, what we think they are doing or being or who they are. And that's Mm -hmm. where I like saying so often of if somebody's telling me they've made an observation of me, and then they've made a judgment. And then in essence, they, this is where he says they are communicating violent, violently with me because they're saying, Hey, well, you have ADHD. So therefore this is what you do. This is how Mm -hmm. you show up. Mm-hmm. And so then unless I say you are exactly right, you know, then they get to say, you're not even being honest with yourself. But, you know, separating observation from judgment is mm-hmm. like, is a huge, takes, it's a big step toward reducing conflict. Mm. And, and I think that one's like, you know, you, you keep your observations and your judgment separate in order to keep others from feeling defensive, because that's where our brains do want to leap and label somebody is careless or lazy or impulsive or, you know, and it's like our, it's like our mouse just rushed to this judgment. Yeah. And I know that we do that because we are, we think that we are going to do that and it's going to help us make sense of things. Mm-hmm. But what that lacks is any curiosity. So there isn't a, mm. tell me about your ADHD. It's the, well, you have ADHD. So obviously you can't pay attention and you can't. And that's why I like the episode we did a little while ago, the, you know, oh, I can pay incredible attention to things that mm-hmm. I care about. Mm-hmm. But so it kind of goes against the grain of what that is. So I like, I love this conversation so much because, so I'm going to start with, I'm going to meet somebody in my office where they are. If it helps them, great. If it doesn't, great. But then I like what you're saying about it's the challenge when somebody uses it as an excuse. You know, well, it's my ADHD. But I had somebody recently that was even saying, yeah, I get tired. And then I say really silly things. So yeah, that's when I'm tired, you know, and I brought the same concept up and said, oh, okay. So that's really cool, though. If you're aware of when you're tired, then then now you have this data that you can use and maybe Mm -hmm. don't try to have deep conversations when you're tired. Mm -hmm. But then I feel like that's where somebody wants to say, right, but I like using it as an excuse though, because then I can say whatever I want and I can say I'm tired, you know, and that's the part where then I think why the labels get uh, given such a bad name because when people weaponize them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know. Where do we go next? So it's like we kind of are on the same page a little bit. Well, but I thought it was interesting because I read that quote to you just before we started and you're yeah. like, oh, I actually, what you said to me was, I actually don't like labels. And I was like, oh. And so then we're, you're like, but let's save this for the thing. So now I'm kind of like, are we on, did I convince you, Tony Overbay? You'd never thought of it my oh. way and now I've convinced you. Oh no. Okay. So here's what's funny. <laughs> I remember saying that before we, but I wasn't paying full attention because I was looking for something else. Isn't right. that funny? So, in the, so, because don't use that because as an excuse you say, that you have ADHD. Come I know, on. right? Well, did you say you like, I see, because you, did you say you like labels? No, I would, well, what I said is I read that libos, labels are for filing for clothing and for, and not for people, but I think I said it in kind of a cynical way. Like I was like, bless yeah, your I think heart. You did, so I'm like, right. And then yeah, you're like, yeah. this is and, actually yeah. a lesbian woman who's this, this very accomplished yeah. tennis player, or whatever and stuff. And I was like, oh, she probably does have a perspective on this. It's worth paying attention to. Yeah. Well, okay, it just, but it's triggering okay, this, things right? for me. It's triggering things for me, things I've been told okay. about being public well, about my labels, right? So, okay, but yeah. I'm going to do, I want to therapy you here because this is like, okay, this is fascinating though, because that mm-hmm. observation and judgment thing that, that I maybe just mentioned, there was the observation of this quote and then mm-hmm. the judgment of, well, she probably doesn't understand. And so then that is kind of what, where we go immediately mm-hmm. rather than I wonder what her experience is. And I'm not trying to make you feel bad, of course, because that's, okay. that's like, we all do that, right? Yeah, we all do it. Um, totally. So, yeah. I mean, I never do, but you know, I get it. Everyone but you and Jesus, you and God. <laughs> Maybe Gandhi. Okay. 
Okay. okay. Maybe. Um, so what do you think about labels? Part, yes. Tell me in a sentence. Like, do you... Oh, that's just, I mean, it's there, whatever. If I really do feel like it's like if the person, it's whatever somebody needs them to be now. But I realize what I like about what you were saying is I don't typically think of them as in the broad scale of people using them to generalize a whole population or group. Mm -hmm. And I realize I'm typically thinking about them with somebody in an office and one on one, one on one with somebody. So then in my mind, it's the, again, if it helps somebody, then great. If it doesn't, great. And then if somebody else is saying, well, that's ridiculous because people need to. And then I'm like, okay, well, that's your opinion. And that's where I just love the concept of differentiation of that. It's going to bring something up for somebody else. And that's a them issue. So if somebody's starting from a place of they like the label, and then if I'm, who am I to say, well, you know, you really shouldn't, because that means this, that's literally me doing that observation and judgment of them. So, and, and I think that's the part that I can't unsee a lot of times is that anybody that's trying to speak to anybody else's experience, I just think that's adorable because- yeah. I don't know what somebody else's experience is, you know. I was so. just talking to a friend the other night who's getting a divorce and he made some comment about I should maybe I should listen maybe I need more advice from people. And I just said I was like I don't think so. I was like <laughs> I think you I think we all know more about our life situation than anyone else and I thought of you immediately. Like mm-hmm. And there have been times when I've needed advice and been so grateful for other perspective and stuff, but I think I've erred on the side of not trusting myself enough more. Not something yeah. I'm learning well, that's to do. Well said. You yeah. know, I'm and, observing and, you saying that, and I'm judging you as saying that that is correct. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, so yeah, labels are a thing. What I kind of come back to this whole idea of labels too is it actually makes me think about food. How we give food emotions. How oh, more. there's nothing that gets in. Well, okay, so I am very dedicated and headstrong. I will not talk negatively about my body in front of my kids. Okay. It's not that I don't have my own body image issues. That. Like I'm a girl in this generation. Like it's in my blood and veins. I feel like to like constantly be like, <laughs> like yeah. checking it out, making sure I feel like worthy that day. Right. Like I'm not proud of it, but it's just, I don't know. Like I fight it all the time. It's not that I'm, but you'll never hear me talk about it. Like never mm. because yeah. I will not let my little girl hear that because I know the damage that can do. So I hear other women say things like, oh, I should eat that. I'm not going to eat that because that's bad or things like that. And I'm like, food isn't bad. Or that was like, oh, like the food was, I don't, we like give food emotions and we give it and we make it really powerful. And I'm like, food is food. Food's feel, food didn't do anything wrong. Like food just is. Yeah. I kind of feel that way about labels and about people are like labels of this labels. I'm like, why are we so mad at labels? Labels didn't do anything wrong. We screwed it up by twisting it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I see it this way too, or or like the pride flag is bad because it means such and such. And I'm like, have you gone and interviewed every single person that flies the pride flag and asked them why? Do you know what I mean? It's it's all of these things where I just feel like we have to stop and recognize like that. I don't know. I guess I come back to, and this is, I'm going to be kind of a brat here, but I'm just amazed at how many people know everything. I'm just amazed. Oh, it's an, it's really cool how, because that's, those are very special people. (laughs) Because the more I've learned in my life, the more I'm like, I don't know anything. Like there's so much to learn. I'm more curious than ever. And so I don't relate with the big generalizations, but I'm like, oh, if I've learned anything, I'm like, dude, life is complex. And I've become less judgmental because I am more aware of my weaknesses. And there's this really yeah. funny, I saw this meme two days ago and I loved it so much. And it says something like, it's like, I healed too much. Now I just hate everybody. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That is funny. I because, do like that one a lot. Because not because I think I'm like the epitome of all healing, but I have done a lot of work on myself and I have I can give myself credit that I went headstrong into therapy and I like did what I was encouraged to do at home. I did the homework. I've made it a lifestyle. Like I care a lot and I've done it. And doing a lot of that, the problem is, I'm sure you can relate to this, is I always know when I'm being unhealthy pretty much. Yeah, oh, And that sure. is the worst. Yeah, it, it, as long as you're willing to admit it. And that's where people, that's that part where people can't acknowledge that maybe they are not doing something that isn't perfect. And that's that, that group. But it's like you, we've talked about this before. Cause I talk a lot about black and white thinking in my speeches and high definition thinking. It's like, man, I miss the days when I just knew everything. 
I just knew it all. Okay, so here's what, what's cool, Julie, is that so <laughs> yeah. it's called the Dunning Kruger effect. Do you know that one? Mm-mm. Tell me about it. Okay, this is you will dig it. I, well, I feel that you will. So it's uh, it's one of the it's like a cognitive bias where people believe they are smarter and more capable than they are, and mm. so this is where it, it's that concept of where the more that you learn, and I know it sounds so cliche, but then the more that you understand that you don't know. Right. And so, yeah, I gave an example recently. I don't get political on my podcast, but I talked about an example. I didn't name the politicians or anything, but imagine a politician that then comes into a town and they want to give a speech and they are in a coal mining town. Mm -hmm. So then they read about a minute, they read a minute's worth of information about coal mining. And so then they just assume I, I probably know everything about coal mining. And so then, you know, the first five minutes they're talking about coal mining and they're, they have empathy for the people in the town. And then by minute 20 or 30, they're like telling the people now how they should actually be mining coal because they, they feel like I'm smart enough. I probably have a pretty good idea about this. And so then one of the most powerful things you can do with the more information you or knowledge you get is recognize the things that I know that I know. So that means there are things that I don't know that I don't know. And so that becomes mm-hmm. more mature. And that's where you start to see the narcissist or the emotionally immature really do have an opinion about everything. And that's where you hear such classic hits as, what does that doctor know? Or, or that therapist is probably just in there to make money or whatever. And so that it's somebody that just said, I, I know better than that person, even though I don't know what they know. And I don't know enough about the experience of the people going in to see them. But they know right. that he's just in it for the money. Or they know that that doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. So that's that, that Dunning-Kruger effect. So the, and it's also... <laughs> I can just go on and on about this. There's a concept called the dark triad, which is like talking about sociopaths and psychopaths. Mm. And one of those is uh, where people are not are unwilling to admit the things that they don't know, you know, or don't know that they don't know. So it's actually a sign so of emotional So they're all maturity. sociopaths and we're not. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. I like this. Right? But isn't that okay. – but it is – it, it can be frustrating. You know everything. And it can be yeah. frustrating like that meme. And like I said, I'm not saying I've healed from everything. You, of all people, know that's not true. But like <laughs> I – that meme of – I have felt that way before where it's like I finally healed and now I just hate everybody. If, that's pretty funny though. It's pretty funny because I've had moments <laughs> where I'm like I don't engage in – like I'm the most annoying person to have in these political conversations now because I'm like – Oh, I don't have an opinion about that because I haven't done hours of research on it. So like by no means do I think yeah. I have any idea. So I listen, I'm like, oh, oh. or I'm just immediately like, oh, where'd you like where do you learn that? And they're like, oh, I heard it on the radio. And I'm immediately like, oh, <laughs> and you're sure? Like, cause you heard it on the radio. Like, I just I am not fun anymore because I'm like, but think about their birth order and think about like, do we really know? Like, I'm not fun anymore because oh, I'm just not yeah. because it is the more like. It's not as like sexy and cool in the headlines to be like, it's complicated, right? Yeah, I, I was going to say, right? That's right. I love that. I don't, yeah, when somebody's like saying, yeah, well, what do you think? And it's like, oh, I mean, I really don't know. Well, yeah, but what do you think? And it's like, well, I think I don't know. I mean, if there's something that I have an opinion on, then yeah. now I'll, I'm very happy to share it because, uh, but if not, I'm, I don't know, I kick a shot at it, but right. I have no confidence in what I'm saying. And that's, and I yeah. love what you're saying because again, I, I'm labeling everybody as emotionally mature. That's a big generalized statement but that's where somebody says yeah but i need you to tell me i'm wrong so then i can now tell you why you're wrong and then we can argue and uh, whoever outlasts it yeah Yeah. that's and that's i love that you said that because some people do say that they almost i I like the when somebody will acknowledge that that is something that they just enjoy doing and then then i start saying okay now we're getting somewhere so now you're accepting the fact that you are just yeah yeah Yeah. right you're just because i have an adorable client that i just love so much i've worked with him forever and he's in college and he I know sometimes where he's throwing out some data. He'll say, you know, I've read. And, and I love what you said earlier because he and I now will get to the point where I'll say, all right, do you really? Because I know, I actually know this one. And then he'll say, yeah, I was just, I just was trying to sound confident. You know? <laughs> and I say, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> but okay, I am I very confident. Thing? Oh. Yeah, no, tell, no, no, no. You, no, you. Well, okay. I want to say real quick about labels. This is what I was looking up when I pretended that I was paying all of the attention <laughs> earlier. Uh-huh. I love okay. it when you do that. But this is okay. This is from Psychology Today. This is a real two paragraphs is all. But it says the long term consequences of labeling a child smart or slow are profound. And then they say in another classic study, uh, this, this researchers Rosenall and Jacobson told teachers at an elementary school that some of their students had scored in the top twenty percent of a test designed to identify academic bloomers, or students who were expected to enter a period of intense intellectual development over the following year. 
In fact, the students were selected randomly and they performed no differently from their unselected peers on a genuine academic test. A year after convincing the teachers that some of the students were due to bloom, Rosenall and Jacobson returned to the school and administered the same test and the results were astonishing among the younger children. The bloomers, who again were no different from their peers a year ago, now outperformed their unselected peers by 10 to 15 IQ mm -hmm. points. So the teachers fostered the intellectual development of the bloomers, producing a self-fulfilling prophecy in which the students who were baselessly expected to bloom actually outperformed their peers. So that is one of those kind of crazy things where they have been labeled as bloomers. They weren't. And then you come back a year later and it played to the tune of 10 to 15 IQ points higher because the teachers were saying, the bloom, you know, well, they're, they're bloomers. And there's a really famous study about rats. It's called the expectation effect where, um, and I'll make it so fast. I speak about this one often where, I don't know, 12 rats, you have six to a group and you say, these are maze bright. And you give six to a group and you say, these are maze dull. And I sell it, you know, and this is a real, this is a very real study. And you say that the maze bright rats were genetically engineered to go through mazes quickly. And then you give the people three and the other ones are just dull. You got the dud rats. And then three days later, the ones that are maze bright go through mazes two point something times faster than the maze dull ones. So it's even just the excitement of the people that are training the rats to go through mazes. It's called the expectation effect. So, you know, you can label somebody as this bloomer and all of a sudden they rise, or you can even get a group of rats to go through a maze faster because of your expectation. And so that's the part where sometimes I feel like, okay, can we harness the power of positive labeling in mm -hmm. a sense? Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Yeah. Wait, are you telling me these rats can feel the positive energy? Yeah. And then, that's a great study. Wow. Yeah. And that was, and then that was, then it's been duplicated a ton. And there's a whole book called The Expectation Effect that's almost spooky because it talks about people that, you know, somebody that had been diagnosed as having some type of cancer passes away. And then they go look at, they finally dig in and like, oh man, my bad. It was a, like a spot on the x ray, you know, or, or things like that. No. But the person was like, yeah. Or Whoa. there's another one that was a woman that was blind and then, and the doctors felt like that wasn't the case, but you know, people had given her, turned like the lights off all around. She'd been told she had sensitivity to the whole, her whole life, you know, and then at some point the, the doctors were able to see that the part of the brain was still reacting to sight. She'd been told for so long that you can't see and let's keep the lights off around you that then finally I almost feel like, and I, this is where my humor comes in too much, where somebody like walks in, flips on the light switch and fakes a, throwing a pass at her. And she's like, whoa, it really wasn't that part. But I mean, that expectation effect or it's pretty crazy. And I think that goes along sometimes mm. with labeling. Yeah. You know, I had somebody tell me I was a good public speaker my whole life. And I, I was just told that in high school, but I wasn't. But then I was like, oh, I'm a good public speaker. And I'm so grateful that somebody gave me that label without any basis, really. So that was kind of nice. Because then you feel like you just rose to the occasion. You're like, oh, I'm oh, like absolutely. a speaker. I'm right. a speaker. Yeah. I'm a speaker. Funny? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is mind trippy. Okay. Let's end with our love note. Okay. Okay. Or do you have one ready? Or did? Yeah, I do. Okay, good. I wasn't ready. Wait, I think before I say one, this, I... before I yes. say this, I had a friend reach. So you know how I made the joke? I was like, no, we got to do random names because then maybe the person listening. What if they're, it's their name? And you're like, whoa, that's high stakes. Now I got to pick the right name. You chose yeah. Peter that day. Someone yeah. on Facebook reached out to me named Peter and was like, um, it was meant to be. I'm pretty sure I have ADHD. And I like felt this zing like when he said it. I got the chills right now. I got to send you a Whoa. screenshot of it. So then okay. I felt like a freaking dirt bag because the next episode <laughs> I said Copernicus the girl. Oh, I got a text from somebody named Copernicus. Hold on. Hang on. I no, hate I you. Stop. <laughs> oh. Emotional dysregulation. Here we go. Oh. No, no, but isn't that crazy? Okay, so now I am really feeling is. the pressure of like, okay, hey, no, but cool. You never be? know. Okay, so today, dear Sarah, I almost said Sarah plain and tall. I don't know why that's what came to mind. <laughs> dear Sarah, I'm your friend ADHD. And you can kind of call me whatever you want to call me. You can call me your happy friend. You can call me, uh, your go juice. You can call me whatever you want. You can call me fluffy nutter pancakes, whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that you're you and that's so cool. And you just like everybody are going to have things that come easily to you and things that don't come as easily to you. And if you want, there's a lot of really cool research and writing about there about under the label ADHD, because that's what a lot of people have chosen to call it. And that may be really helpful to you. 
But no matter what, just don't get stuck in thinking it matters what it's called, what matters is you and all the incredible complex things that make you you and just work with it and become the most... um, I'm oh I'm running out here. We can't record this late. You're doing so good. Back Sarah, I'm back with you. <laughs> this is ADHD speaking. <laughs> and also you are fantastic and love ADHD. That was awesome. I was about to have Sarah's ADHD's gonna older hate brother me. come in. Okay. <laughs> so you're gonna have ADHD's little brother come in. What was, I was he gonna, gonna have say? Old, no, old ADHD's older brother come in and he was gonna say something like, I don't know, hey, scram, get out of here. But then I realized I couldn't remember what if you Maybe were. Maybe we have something the there. Part. Yeah. For future episodes. Stay tuned. I'd like it. I'd Julie, that was too. a fun topic. Thanks for yeah, picking that. I'm glad we talked about that. labels. It gave me a lot to think about because we're I mean, we're using a label in our title of our podcast love yeah, adhd right yep, yep. and yep. i think there's yep. power there right you as good yeah that's right yeah it's good and we kept it short yeah. why did we keep it short and make sure that the name was in it because people with adhd tend to struggle with attention so we're like if they're scrolling through podcasts it's that's got a judgment a, that's, that's a what judgment, you're the one really? that said it I, I you know, said, i'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> you said you're like probably adhd should be in the title because they have adhd so it's got to be like bam. i really did ADHD. I and I think I it's really brilliant. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I, that's what I would need. Yeah. Thank you for labeling me as brilliant. Did I do that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Tony. Oh, go to our website. Uh, love-adhd.com. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we really do that's like fun. each other a lot. Oh, a ton. It's fun. I think most, fun. Pe- most of the feedback I've gotten people are really enjoying what a good relationship you and I have. But sometimes Same. I no, hear I myself, told, I'm like, uh, are we mean? Yeah. But I think it's good. I think we're, we're okay. hilarious. That's we're hilarious. I feel safe. We're amazing. Safe. Yeah. Hey, on the YouTube video, watch this now. Ready? Here we'll do this. Did I do that one before? Oh, it didn't even work. You're trying to do the heart? Yeah. It, there it is. <gasps> oh my goodness. Now I do feel loved. Look at that. Hey, it's not as cool as your yeah. YouTube video, but this is the, oh <laughs> I forgot. Balloons. I forgot about the balloons. Look. Okay. Recognize okay. this. I do. It's from your book. I was going to say earlier, that's a t-shirt. You from, that's it? your book jacket cover. Isn't I did. Cool? 100% I did. I just picked it up at really my cool. publishers. They have it in black, white, and navy blue now. And I kind of dig the navy blue. I think I oh, like it. I would like a cool? navy blue shirt, please. Okay. Okay. Maybe for Christmas. Okay. Okay. Right, Everybody. Julie. Thanks. Enjoy. Bye, Tony. Yep.